So let's see if we can like, let's see if we can flip this around a little bit and talk about how it would affect the teaching of mathematics. And we touched on this. You can tell I'm not a mathematician because I think I had 14 slides for writing and I have three for math. Sorry about that. <laughs> but I'm happy for any of you to jump in there. Um, okay, so obviously when we start out at the grammar stage, we are talking about arithmetic. We're laying the foundation for later high-level abstract thinking. We're getting comfortable with numbers and speaking about numbers and using numbers and connecting those to real life. And there, there are really, there are two major ways, again, not a math teacher, but there are two major ways of teaching math. Conceptual, and your, your good math programs will do a little bit of both, ideally. Conceptual math clearly explains the reasons why operations work as they do. Sort of starts at the logic stage, as it were. Procedural math teaches students to solve problems by giving them a series of steps to do. So that's starting with the grammar stage. So in terms of popular math programs, Saxon math is definitely procedural. You start with the facts and you do the facts every single day. And from the mastery of these facts, eventually you learn the concepts behind the facts. Conceptual math, on the other hand, starts with the concepts, starts with the abstractions, asks the student to figure out how the concepts affect individual mathematical operations. Now, the tricky thing when you're in a classroom, this is actually easier if you're homeschooling, is that some kids are better off starting in one place and some are better off starting in the other. And with arithmetic, it's important to recognize that particularly mathematically gifted students have that same intuitive understanding of number operations that naturally gifted writers have of taking those words and putting them down on paper. They couldn't tell you how they do it, but they know, they understand. Right? Those students can start with conceptual math and are going to resist you mightily if you make them drill facts. They don't want to do it. They don't see the point. Your, um, your, your procedural math kids, the ones who need the facts first, will be completely lost if you start with the concepts and then try to get them to understand how that affects operations. They have to start with the operations. It's a little bit like there, there are two kinds of music students. They're the music students who start out playing by ear, and then they don't want to learn how to read music. And then they're the music students who start out with their scales, read the music, and don't necessarily get very far in playing freely and enjoying music as music, right? So our challenge when we're in the grammar stage with arithmetic is to recognize those two different groups of students. And I said this in the last session, a lot of times those students who are ready to start with procedural ma uh, conceptual math, they're ready to start with the abstractions. We call them gifted. That's true, but they still need to learn how to do the procedures. And kids who start with the procedures can be encouraged to move into and to enjoy conceptual math, but it's going to take them a little longer. It takes patience. And a lot of what happens in a classroom is that the kids who need all of that drill to start off with, they need the procedures, they need the concrete operations, are not encouraged enough to move into conceptual math at a time that is developmentally appropriate for them. It is, it is very, very common for a student to be in sixth grade and not ready to go into pre-algebra because they're still in that concrete operation stage. They haven't made the mental switch over. And we have to not pressure those students, because if we push them into pre-algebra, which by its nature is more conceptual, we're going to lose them. And with a sixth or seventh grader, as soon as they decide they're not good at something, you've lost them. Right? So we have to figure out how to navigate with math this very complex interaction of the grammar and the logic stage ways of thinking. Because I think more than in any other subject, those two things can go hand in hand in the same classroom. Now, once you start getting into more rigorous math, I feel like the, um, the human side of math often falls out of the equation. We should be reading biographies of mathematicians, doing puzzle books, 
for smaller children, picture books, but don't underestimate the joy of picture books for older students. Remind them that this is fun. Remind them that this is a language that tells them about reality, that tells them about the world. In order to keep them engaged as that critical abstract way of thinking is developing and maturing, because that's what we're waiting for. I mean, I do, I do think that math is, tends to be more of a waiting game than some of the other subjects, because we're waiting for that maturity to kick in. Now, um, another, uh, another way to do this um, is to be very, very conscious of real life math skills. It often helps students who are still sort of you know, in that procedural area. They're not ready to make the jump to thinking conceptually about mathematics. If we can create as many connections as possible with real life. Because the problem that they're having is they don't understand why. They don't get the point. Why do they need to do pre-algebra? Why are you solving for an unknown factor? Unknown factors are not part of my life. I'm just gonna deal with the known factors. Um, and, and that really is the big jump, right? Is dealing with the unknown factor. So. If you give them real life math problems, you are giving them real life examples of an unknown factor, okay? You don't actually know what your profit is gonna be for your kid run business. You gotta solve for X. Um, you don't know how much it's gonna cost to drive the car to and from the special event because you, you haven't checked to see what the actual price of gas is this morning. Right. There are so many ways in which giving them these real life math problems, although it seems very, I don't know, it seems procedural, it seems lower level, is preparing them to move on into higher mathematics because it's teaching them that math has a connection with real life. And the connection of math to real life is the thing that tends to be missing, I think, in our math instruction. Jordan Allenberg says, mathematics is the extension of common sense by other means. I love that quote. So that means that as we are then moving towards the rhetoric stage, um, the students who've already made that jump into thinking conceptually and aren't continually saying, why should I solve for X? They're actually really interested to find out what X is. I'm going to move on through, this is the standard high school progression, algebra one and two, geometry, trigonometry, pre-calculus and calculus. So let's think about those kids that we're still kind of dragging along. The ones who say, how many years of math do I need to do? Give me the bare minimum so that I can get into college. And why does it matter? Rhetoric stage mathematics, high school mathematics, has to involve some investigation of why we are asking these questions. Right? I was always actually pretty good at math. I mean, I was because I like solving puzzles. Um, I was 48 or 49 when I realized what calculus was. I was like, oh, you're dealing with elements that keep changing. Nobody ever told me that, you yeah. um, know? And the only reason I found out about it was because I was reading a biography of Newton, which was a really, really good biography, and explained why this was important. And then I was like, I want to go back and do calculus now. It's not going to happen, but ideally in, in a world. Um, <laughs> Instead, I feel like that particularly once you get past Algebra 2, what we have is this famous quote from one of, uh, one of Newton's students. It says, he remarked as Newton passed him on the street, there goes the man who has written a book that neither he nor anyone else understands. Um, understanding why Newton was asking the questions he was asking, what he was trying to solve and why he was trying to solve it at that particular point in time, if that is part of the conversation about high school upper level mathematics, then students understand they're not just doing puzzles, they're not just putting a grade on the transcript for the college admissions officer, but they're taking part in an exploration of the phenomenon of the world. You know, they are understanding reality. And that's why I have this emphasis in the logic stage on doing real life math problems. Now, I am not qualified to talk about how you do that in upper level mathematics because I simply don't have the base knowledge. But that is what will keep students engaged and have them thinking of mathematics, not as how much of this do I have to study, but another way of exploring the world. <laughs>